Sometimes when ministering healing to the sick, like I, I've been in all kinds of places and um, praying for people and ministering and healing and stuff. <clears throat> and sometimes, <laughs> yeah, sometimes it happens that uh, we'll lay my hands on somebody for healing and then um, something starts moving around in their body, like the pain moves from one part to another part and that, then you know you're dealing with a spirit. So there are, um, Jesus referred, in the Bible he said, um, the, uh, he referred to unclean spirits, he referred to spirits of infirmity, so spirits connected with sickness and disease, and not every uh, sickness and disease is, is uh, um, directly linked because there is an evil spirit. You know, we live in a fallen world. We, uh, there's all kinds of things that influence from the things we eat and the things, the heredity passed down to us in, in, the, in, in different things. Um, I mean, at the source, the devil is the cause, right? Because he deceived mankind. And so uh, when mankind is disconnected from God, then sin and death and sickness and disease came into the world. So it can be traced back to the devil. And that's why Jesus said, you know, what's easier to say, you know, your sins are forgiven you or rise up and walk. But he came to, to um, do away with both sin and all the works of the devil, which is sickness and disease and all of that. So, um, so sometimes if you are praying for somebody and or you're, okay, the word prayer in the Bible, uh, when Jesus said, if you it's, it's, it's not generally, it's not pray like we generally think of prayer, like asking God, would you please, you know, when it's used in the Bible, like the prayer of faith or the, um, you know, it, it, it's more like a, a decree that's being made because it's based on the covenant that Jesus uh, brought us into by his own blood. So remember at the Last Supper, he, he said, this is the new covenant, the New Testament in my blood. As often as you do this, remember me. He's the, the reason for it all, right? So don't forget about me, Jesus said, <laughs> as you do this. And so Jesus, there's a new covenant. There's a new life that we live because of what Jesus did, which is very different than the people in the Old Testament that they, you know, God was still busy there doing many good things and the prophets, you know, and all these kind of things. Uh, but everybody didn't have access to that. Nobody was the temple of the Holy Spirit <laughs> like we are now. That's why Jesus said the least in the kingdom of God is greater than the greatest in the Old Testament, which he said was John the Baptist because he had the greatest message that the Messiah is coming. So. But um, now we are literally the temple of the Holy Spirit, so we have a greater access. In Hebrews, it talks about um, in times past, God spoke to us through the prophets, but now he speaks to us through his Son. And we have a better covenant based on better promises. So now God can interact with us the way that he created us for, like Adam and Eve in the beginning, before they sinned. Now God can do that again, and he can walk with us, we can walk with him. <clears throat> and so, um, uh, what was that? S say again. What's that? You were going to speak to us on prayer. Oh, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Gotcha. Thank you. So, so prayer is actually, if you look in the original language there, it's not really requesting or something. It's actually demanding. But it's not demanding like, God, I demand you to do this. It's not like that. It's placing a demand on the covenant that was established by his will with his blood. So it's something that God wanted to do. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So this covenant was God's idea that, you know, that all who would receive Jesus would be restored into relationship with God and that there would be this covenant that we participate in which is so sure 
that it was sealed in Jesus' own blood. And so Jesus spoke about it as the new covenant. The new test, you know, in the New Testament, we read about this new covenant, this new testament. And that's why the Holy Spirit is like our advocate, our lawyer, and he teaches us how what what we should think and say and do in order to see the promises that are in this covenant manifest in our lives and in the lives of others. So now this is why when you see whatever you, um, if you don't doubt in your heart and when you pray, but believe, you know, believe in your heart, then you shall have whatever it is you ask. That word pray is actually to place a demand on the covenant, which is basically um, you, we are drawing on the covenant. Does, it, does that make sense? It's, so it's like, so it's not like necessarily, please, if it be your will, you know, would you heal, Father? But it's more like, thank you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name is, is what, you know, the, 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 the signature, the blood that was signed for the, for the covenant to be effective. And so when we are um, it going in Jesus' name and we are declaring healing in Jesus' name, we are tapping into the covenant that Jesus established. We are tapping into what God desired to do. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to, to heal uh, the sick, to, to mend the brokenhearted, to deliverance to the captives, the year of jubilee, which is debt cancellation. There's all these things that the Spirit of the Lord was upon the Messiah, Jesus, to do. And when we receive him, we receive all these things. And it's, it's sealed in his blood by covenant. So now when we agree with what God has established, then it releases um, the Holy Spirit to, and the, angel, the angelic host to actually you know, do it, to bring it to pass. I mean, it's already... Um, available, but it's like to, to actually manifest that. So when we pray, the prayer of faith will heal the sick, the Lord will raise him up, right? So what is the prayer of faith? It is a drawing on the covenant. And that's what we should be realizing when we're ministering or when we're um, praying for somebody for healing or whatever. It's more like, what does God want to do? What, which is to heal. We don't even, you know, he, he doesn't, nobody came to Jesus and Jesus turned them away saying, no, it's not God's will to heal you. <laughs> or, or, you know, he always would heal and stuff. And so we, when we pray and when we, um, for healing and stuff, that's actually what we're doing. We're making a draw on the covenant. You don't even need to use words if you don't. But if you do say something, let it be the words that the Holy Spirit our advocate is giving, which are in line with the agreement and the covenant, which is yes and amen. <laughs> All the promises of God are yes and amen. That, that's what the Lord has to say about his will. Yes, amen. So it's already in the covenant, Isaiah 53, the healing, the, the deliverance, the, you know, and so when we're, we're just saying, Father, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, we agree together. Thank you. You know, that, that, that is recognizing the covenant, agreeing together. If two of you agree on earth that's touching anything, it shall be done. And, you know, that is, that's what's going on there. And then we stand in that. And we don't waver from that. For he who wavereth is like a wave of the sea. Let him not uh, think that he'll receive anything. So we need to stand. Having done, having, having um, agreeing with that covenant and in faith, that prayer of faith, that agreement, yes, amen. And, you know, from the heart and with the heart we believe, then, then we stand. Smith Wigglesworth would get upset with people, you know, when they, when he would like, uh, they came for healing and he would just, you know, minister healing. Yes, in Jesus' name. If they would come back and for a second time, he would actually be like, he, he, <laughs> he's not ex necessarily a loving example to follow, kicking people off the stage and <laughs> stuff like that. But the point was that he was, he, he, he got what he, what he prayed for, right? You know, he was, he, he didn't, he said, what well, is done in Jesus name. And he just, he just settles and he stands on that. Okay. Uh, that's what I want to say about prayer. Okay. Now jumping to a different topic. <laughs> uh, we were talking about um, 
we need to understand the, a little bit about the warfare that we find ourselves in and, and what's going on. And, and when we understand where it came from and what's happening, uh, it, we're better able to see what's going on and to deal with it like Jesus would. Okay, so when, um, when Jesus was in a place and they went on the sea to go to the other side, this storm came up and everybody, you know, his disciples were like, we're all going to die, you know, and Jesus was sleeping, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and then he, he rebuked the waves and the sea and all this stuff. Anyway, when they got to the other side, there was this man possessed, or, or sorry, let me rephrase that. There was this man with, with all these demonic uh, entities, and Jesus asked them, what's your name? He said, Legion, right? You remember the situation? And um, so Jesus uh, cast out the demons, because there were many of them, but he just cast them out. And they wanted to go into the pigs. We were talking about pigs, right? <laughs> it was, and why, you know, snakes and pigs are, are sometimes connected with wrong spirits and in people's minds and stuff like that. Because the snake was in the Garden of Eden, the devil spoke through, and Jesus sent the spirits into the pigs. Well, the, the spirits asked to go into the pigs. And the thing is that what most people don't know is that in that area, it was like a, they, they had a temple to Zeus on the hill there. And these pigs were used for the sacrifices for, in the temple there for Zeus, which was a demonic thing going on there. And so Jesus allowed those pigs to be um, gotten rid of. And that's what was going on there. You know, and so, <clears throat> um, what was I going to say about that? Uh, what? Oh, and then, so after he cast out those demons, they got in the boat and went right back. That's all they did there. So Jesus was led by the Spirit to go to the other side of the sea, cast out that demonic, uh, um, the demonic leader for the area. Let me say like that. Cast him out and then go back. And then he left that area and just went back to the other side. So this is, you know, what it, part of what it means to be led by the Spirit to do things which, didn't you just go that way? Yeah, you cast it and he came right back. Yeah, he was led by the Spirit. And so uh, he took out the, 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 the he uns, uns, unseated that head demonic entity for the area. Um, now, um, there are, a, there's a whole um, lot of different entities that we generally call demons and stuff like that. In Ephesians, it talks about, you know, different rankings of demonic entities and uh, the powers and the principalities and the, you know, different things. Um, but there's also unclean spirits. <clears throat> that Jesus spoke about on different occasions and he was casting them out. And he said, you will trample on serpents and scorpions and nothing shall hurt you. Um, serpents and scorpions are earthbound creatures. And um, so anything that we encounter in the demonic uh, realm, maybe around us, we have authority over in Jesus' name because these are the earthbound demonic entities. They're unclean spirits. Let me, let me just say it like that. So there's unclean spirits, and, and they seek expression, okay? They seek to uh, express themselves through, because that's the only way they can get expression. So when they're cast out of somebody, then it says, Jesus said they go through like dry places, and they're like, ugh, I don't, I, I want to seek expression. Let me go back to where I was cast out from, right? And so that unclean spirit goes back there. And if that person has not been um, filled with the Spirit of God through faith in Christ, and so this, this is the thing when we cast out demons and deliverance and all this kind of thing, uh, we need to be ready to disciple a person. We need to be ready to lead them to the Lord and explain about how to be filled with the Spirit of God. Because if you cast out a demonic entity and fine, it goes, but then 
it comes back and that person is just there empty. There's no such thing as the vacuum, remember? We were talking about that earlier. So what that means is the enemy is going to come back. If the Holy Spirit isn't living there, then he's going to come and, and be there. Yeah, and, and it's going to be worse than, than the first thing. So, so we have to, if we talk about deliverance and all these things, we also have to talk about discipleship and helping people you know, come to Christ and understand um, you know, how to walk with God like, like we're talking about now because um, they, they need to understand what's going on and how that greater is he who is in them, Christ, than he, the demonic entities in the world. Because people live in fear. And I'm sure, you know, a lot of you, um, you know what I'm talking about. There's a, there's a, I used to go and minister like a couple times a week in Dipslut. I don't know if you know Dipslut. Yeah, and um, quite, you know, we had all kinds of things going on there. But um, we were praying and seeing the sick healed and all these things. And then even the Sangoma came and asked us to go pray for, for her uh, child because she couldn't get her well and and so so people will see the power of God and the authority of God and that's an opportunity to share Jesus you know but we do have to know that there are these unclean spirits and they seek expression and but we do have authority over them so um, the, there was the question of you know how how do these things entities influence uh, people like a, a Christian, a believer, you know, how does that work? I mean, Peter was one day he received a revelation, thou art the Christ, you know, and Jesus said, blessed are you because my heavenly father revealed that to you. And then the next day, you know, Jesus had to rebuke him and say, get behind me, Satan, <laughs> because you savor us not the things of God, but of people. So it's, it just shows that how we need to stay not lukewarm. We need to stay hot in our relationship with God. Because when we're lukewarm, like the Laodiceans, right? When we're lukewarm, then we're not taking decisive action. We're not um, seeking after the Lord with our whole heart. We're not acknowledging Him in all our ways. So we've, we become, and then in that lukewarmness, the enemy can come in and deceive and, and, you know, lies, we can dece deceive. And so we just have to be aware that, um, okay, I'll tell you something else. There was an astronaut who, um, you know, he went up into the, you know, beyond the Earth's atmosphere and all of that. And he was a Christian. And he said that uh, once he got beyond a certain level in the Earth's atmosphere, it's like he could hear God's voice so clearly. And he's like, what? What is it? God, you know, it's like all of the obstructions weren't there anymore. And he was like, what's going on? It's like, it, it, and, and, um, and he said later that, that God showed him it was because that these unclean spirits, they hang around the people. Right? And there's no people in space. <laughs> you know? And so the interference, when you say, when we, when we think, oh, you know, can't hear God's voice very clearly and all of these things, it's because we're in this broken world. There are unclean spirits. They run interference. Remember, we were talking about Daniel, and for three weeks he was praying and fasting, and then finally angel Gabriel came and said, well, I was sent from the first day, but the prince of Persia and all this withstood me. And so there's that spiritual warfare going on. So we have to understand that just because we don't see a promise of God fulfilled instantly doesn't mean it's not on its way. Because it's already been paid for. The table, is, it's already ours. But sometimes there is this process, and it's not necessarily your fault or somebody's fault, but sometimes there is a process of interference in this where there are these unclean spirits that are, that are just, you know, and others that are just um, interfering. And we have to, the more diligent and hot we are in our relationship with God, just like a hot knife cuts through butter easier than a, a cold knife would, right? It's, it's like it says the, um, the effective, passionate prayer of a righteous person 
has a, a big effect, the scripture says. So there's something about passion. There's something about our heart united to God's heart. And that passion that is flowing and that walk and relationship that we share, that when we pray and we speak, it carries more of God in it and his authority. And therefore, you know, it, um, there are certain of God's generals that, you know, when they showed up in a city, all of the demons would clear out because he just set foot in the city. So what is that? It's, it's, it's not that God favors one person above another or anything like that. It's just um, we can choose to obey what God has said. We can choose to live in a, um, without limitations for God by our yieldedness to him, and then God is able to work through that accordingly. So it's not that God is just handpicking, okay, you know, it's like God has called all of us to, um, as children of God, as his children, family, and there's no demonic entity that can withstand Christ in you, but it's, it's Christ in you. <laughs> so to the degree we are walking in oneness, to, with God is the degree that, you know, um, that we will be effective. So there, remember when uh, the disciples said to, um, uh, the disciples were, were struggling to cast a spirit, uh, an unclean spirit out of a, a, a boy, the boy, right? And then when Jesus came, the father came to him and said, I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't do it. So, um, and Jesus was disappointed because he expected them to be able to do it, right? He said, oh, how long will I bear with you, you generation that's not seeing things correctly, <laughs> right? So he expected his disciples to be able to do it. And, and um, in one of the Gospels, it says this, this kind goes out by prayer, um, some translations add fasting, but that's literally the same thing because it's so you can focus on pr your prayer. But so what's going on there is simply if the perspective, if we have a perspective that's not quite in line with God's perspective, then prayer and interaction with God in a focused manner will help us to where God's point of view rises up within us because we're drawing near to him. And that's the idea of prayer and fasting. It's to help us. It's not to, to convince God of anything. He's already convinced. But it's up to us to draw near to God so that his, his, the way God sees things will rub off on us in that atmosphere of, you know, where the two are becoming one and then God's own uh, perspective is shared with us. And, and the hindrances for that are broken down because we want to remove all barriers between us and God. And in that process, then we, we begin to see more clearly how God sees and feel how God feels. And the passion of, of God rises up within us. Um, it says that Jesus healed by compassion. He had compassion. <clears throat> so compassion is to be compelled by passion in a godly manner. So the passionate, fervent prayer, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So there's something about when our hearts are joined to God that um, they, the two become one with God in control. And God's own passion rises up within us because his heart is shared with us. And we begin to feel how God feels and see as God sees so then we can do as God does. And it's him through us. And he who has entered um, the rest of faith in Hebrews 4, we were talking about Hebrews 4, it says that um, he who has entered <clears throat> the rest of faith has ceased from his own works and entered. And, and what does that mean? That means now God can do his works because we're not relying on our own strength but the strength of the Lord, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So 
when we stop with our own works, then we fix our eyes on Jesus and we ask the Holy Spirit to do what we can't do and we rely fully on him, then all of a sudden, and we're just having done all to stand and rest in that place with childlike faith and peace, knowing God is faithful and just so it becomes more simple, not more complicated in that regard, then the simplicity of the childlike faith and the trust we have in God is enough for us to just stand there. And um, yeah, and sometimes we just have a lot of distractions or warfare going on and we just need to have a focused time of prayer. And that's what Jesus was talking about. This kind goes out by prayer, by fasting. He's talking about how we need to uh, see God's point of view more clearly and feel his heartbeat more clearly in the matter. So we should just draw near to him, submit to God, yield to his spirit, draw near to him, he will draw near to us. And in that secret place, the atmosphere is such that faith, God's perspective will be rising up within us because the two have become one and God's spirit is able to rise up within us. Does that make sense? So, yeah. Um, any questions? Fasting, a lot of people, I used to think of fasting as a way to kind of, I don't know, convince God to, to do whatever that was. Um, I, I didn't ne maybe articulate it that way, but that was kind of the impression before, you know. But then, you know, we, we read in the scripture how it says the fast that God desires is to uh, free the captives, to help those in need. And, you know, in other words, to focus on the things that God is focusing on because we're distracted with something else, which is of a lesser perspective, maybe a perspective of the world and whatever, and it's not God's perspective. So um, fasting helps us to um, get more diligent in, our re in regards to our relationship with God or our seeking God so really, it's not that God is changing anything, but we, our perspective is changing, our focus is changing, it's becoming more where it should be, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Because when you don't eat, you tend to want to get resolution really quickly <laughs> because you want to eat, <laughs> right? And, and it's like, but the point also is it says fast, you know, it says, you know, talks about helping others, so maybe taking your meal, not just not eating, but maybe helping somebody else with what you would have had, you know, and so, so then you're also helping somebody else, and the Bible talks about that's the kind of fast that God appreciates. But so fasting is for our benefit, to help us to look unto Jesus more effectively, more diligently, uh, to focus on the things that, of God, that should be focused on, because um, yeah, life and life happens and distractions happen and, you know, we can just get busy with things, but, but God may have so much more. He does have so much more for us. So, fo so fasting is just a way to help us get more, um, clarity and focus on, on the things we should be focused on. And, uh, but, but the point is that we should always live with that kind of focus. So when we kind of drift away from that being hot in our relationship with God and we're becoming more lukewarm, then fasting helps us to get back to where we should be. And the goal is to stay there yeah. to where we don't need to fast or not. But, but the point is often we do need to because it's just helpful for us. Yeah, and, and, the, and what I've found also is that if my heart is really fixed in the right place when I'm fasting, like I'm really seeking after God and his heart and for all of him to expand in and through me, then, then the hunger becomes less of an issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if we're fasting like maybe because we should or something like that, then it becomes more of a chore. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You make it a ritual. Yeah. So, so, so it's good to do it as led by God, to do it because you truly 
do want God to be expressed in, in your life and what you're doing and, and to help his will be established and for that relationship. So, you know, it's, then it becomes fruitful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and from a standpoint of we are really thankful, you know, because, because we know it's written, sealed in the blood of Jesus. It's a sure thing. It's already provided, so we can thank him. Sometimes we can get into saying the right thing, but it's without the revelation, really, of what we have. So, for example, if we're, if we're thankful from our heart, then that means we know that God is faithful, it's taken care of, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's settled, and we just stand there and we can thank him from our heart, you know? And, and so everything can be an act of worship, actually. Everything, it says, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord and not like unto people. And this, is, this becomes then everything as an act of worship. Whatever we do, if we do it as unto the Lord, we're gonna do it with our heart and it's, and it's as unto God. Um, I wanted to read one scripture here just to kind of touch on the, uh, what we were talking about, these unclean spirits and stuff. In 1 Peter 1, verse 18, it says, You know that it was not with perishable things like silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. So I know that, you know, there... Um, well, well, let me just read this part again. In 1 Peter 1, verse 18 and 19, You were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. And you were redeemed from this by the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So we cannot look to our ancestors. We cannot look to any person like we can look to Jesus because it, it actually says the empty way of life handed down from the ancestors. In other words, you know, um, not, not true things, not good things, but it says the precious blood of Christ is what has redeemed us. And there's one mediator, 1 Timothy 2, 5, between God and man. So if we want to engage with God and, and you know, it's, it's through Jesus Christ and, and, and it's not another person or, or anything like that. And in fact, um, these, some of these unclean spirits, they masquerade as the Bible refers to them as familiar spirits. Familiar spirits are familiar with uh, you, with your ancestors, with your grandma. You know, they, they're, they hang around this earth. They are like these serpents and scorpions, these earthbound demonic entities that we refer to as demonic entities, these unclean spirits. And so, you know, some of these... Um, uh, you can go to people to find out your future and, you know, these witches and, and all these kind of things. What's going on there? Because somebody goes there and then this person will say true things, meaning, you know, they'll, they'll be able to say, oh, I see that your mother died of this or this and this happened to you and there's no way they could have known that. But that's because there's familiar spirits that have been around since the flood, basically. Um, so now these are disembodied spirits, unclean spirits that are hanging around seeking expression. And the way they seek expression is through people. And so they will try to hook uh, people's attention on themselves, maybe through a person, by foretelling the future or... or you know, doing a curse or a thing where something happens. But these are just familiar spirits who are able to tap into maybe what they even caused to happen, bad things before, and then they say, now the same thing's gonna happen to you. And if you believe that, then you buy into this lie and then it has power over you and you bring a curse on yourself. 
So that's why the Bible warns against going to anybody who um, would do this type of thing, you know, uh, to, to like uh, fortune telling and familiar spirits and, and, and all these kinds of things because uh, there's one mediator that um, we go through and that's Jesus Christ. Anything else we put ourselves in danger of deception or in danger of getting deceived um, and yeah. And you know what happens like, so God, on, on God's side, we, he wants us and we need to abide in him, right? To live in that secret place in a constant relationship. And on the other side, the enemy wants to um, create and feed these strongholds within our own lives and way of thinking. And the way he, the way that, and so the, the battlefield is what we choose to focus on and believe in. So as we abide in God and we realize that he has destroyed all the works of the, the devil and we choose to just, you know, engage with him. But on the other side, the enemy tries to at regular intervals because they're not, you know, a demonic entity can't be everywhere at one time. So what they do is they, you know, they don't understand time like we understand time. Like they don't have a watch and they don't, they don't have this concept of time. They weren't created, you know, in that sense, uh, to, in that, to, to be, they weren't to be in this realm that we are. So, I mean, uh, to operate and, and live like these unclean spirits are, are down here seeking expression through us. So what they do is they, they actually, um, they have to look at the stars, they look at the moon, and when things line up every 30 days or every whatever, whatever, and then that's their cues, and then they do their regular things that have worked in times past with people. So what I mean by that, if you've ever had a feeling like, man, what, you know, this person said the same bad thing to me, like this other person a month ago or w whatever, and it seems like wherever you go, the same kind of thing is being said to you because these familiar spirits, they're getting different people to try to, to get you to accept it, yeah. you know? And, you know, they, they've, so they're constantly looking at our lives, and if they find some, a chink in the armor, if they find something that they were able to get to you with, they write that down. And you can be sure that on regular intervals, they're going to try to do that again and again and make you feel that again and again to do that same thing. And so they, they use them. That's why the Bible says don't, you know, astrology and all this stuff, don't, don't do that because we seek God. But because the demonic realm, they rely on the alignment of the stars and this and that as their cues. Oh, hey, we need to go back to so-and-so and do that again. You know, that's what they... They do so they get in these cycles yeah. where they um where they do that and so uh and sometimes you know the bible talks about uh strongholds and uh casting down these strongholds um through the renewing of our mind and bringing every thought captive and all that stuff so these strongholds are areas where these these unclean spirits have gotten to us and they found things that work and we begin to adopt that way of thinking oh i'll never you know whatever or you know i i'm like this i'm like that or i can't do that and i'm this let me tell you from god's perspective there's no impossibilities you can do anything through christ who strengthens you okay but the devil is the opposite he will try to convince you you're worthless you're good for nothing you know and he'll try to grind you down he makes you feel inferior he makes you and he'll use different things anything he can pull from to try to create division to try to create between people between things just it doesn't matter what it is he just doesn't want people united in god because united in god we are powerful. God works through unity. He is the Trinity, but they are one. But they are three, but they are one. So the body of Christ needs to operate as one. So the devil is always fighting unity. He's always fighting. But unity is not something that you can command 
obey me. Or it's not, it's not like that. It's trust that is garnered through love, faith, trust, working through love and interaction and people doing the right thing. And then you learn to trust each other. And then, you know, that's how, how, how um, unity is, is realized. And so the devil's always trying to just do the opposite. He'll try to get somebody to say something and they don't even realize they're saying it. It's just the enemy comes and, you know, like speaks through somebody, you know, and that can happen too. So it's, it's, we're really engaged in spiritual warfare. We need to understand that there's these uh, demonic entities and that's what they do. And if they weren't here, oh, that's what I wanted to say about the astronaut. <laughs> so the astronaut, when he went above there, it was like clear. There wasn't this interference. There wasn't this you know, whatever, because the demonic entities, they, they don't hang around just floating around in space. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, but when he came back here, oh, it was like, again, he had to, things became more difficult because there's this warfare going on. But we do have to remember, greater is he that's in us, he that's in the world, and we can walk in this secret place where the enemy can't touch us. But we have to, we have to, we have to fight to stay in that place. It's not... It's like, it's like a stream which is flowing this way, and it's almost like you have to constantly just be swimming this way, and so it, it, it takes diligence. And the Bible talks about being diligent and being steadfast, and um, in 2 Peter 1, it, it, it talks about things that we need to add to our faith, right? Remember, add to your faith, you know, character, virtue, uh, steadfastness, kindness, uh, love. So these are qualities of God that we're partakers of the divine nature also of God that we need to bring to the table. It's like God has done everything he's going to do. He's waiting for his enemies to be made a footstool. And they're going to be made a footstool because you realize who you are is somebody with amazing created value. A book is written about your life. God wrote before you were even born. And that you accept that and you step into all that God has for you because you trust God, you believe in him, and you're not going to listen to the devil anymore. And all those strongholds that he has kind of, that you let be created there, you tear those down because now you're going to believe what God says, which is only good things about you. And then you don't give any uh, inch, you don't inch, um, centimeter, <laughs> you don't give any space to the devil. And then the devil cannot do anything because you're not giving him any space to do it in your head, in your way of thinking, in your and that's why it's so important to just, you know, read, study the word, uh, abide in that secret place, seek the Lord because and and because uh, the enemy's not sleeping. He's he's constantly trying stuff and we need to be um, you know, aware of the, the schemes. <laughs> and you know what, what, what also happens sometimes in Luke 4, 28, it says, um, when everyone present heard Jesus' words, they erupted with furious rage. They mobbed Jesus and threw him out of the city, dragging him to the edge of the cliff on the hill on which that had been built, uh, ready to throw him off. Sometimes, um, remember when Jesus was riding the donkey and coming into uh, to town and they were all, yay, the Messiah is coming and da 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 da. And then some days later, they, they were like, they would rather have Barabbas released rather than Jesus when he was in front of Pilate. So what caused the change there is, is that they had, their expectations were not accurate. In other words, they had a, this idea that the Messiah would come and be a military leader and um, defeat Rome right then and there. And so when Jesus didn't do that, they turned on him and said, well, give us Barabbas. At least he's going to try to do that again. That's what Barabbas did. He was trying to overthrow the Roman government. 
you know. And so these people who were singing the praises of Jesus, yes, the Messiah, the next day or after, soon after that, they were like, crucify him. Unrealistic expectations. And so we need to make sure that our expectations are the ones that God's word gives us and we don't make assumptions and so that that's the danger of um, forms of religion without relationship is that you know it can really lead us in the wrong direction um, so it's just to be aware of because there are the enemy likes to use religion <laughs> religious things and you know to deceive and to give people wrong um, wrong ideas that can really lead them away from the one Savior of the world. And so we need to make sure that we just understand there's one mediator. His name is Jesus Christ. And we need to read his word in order to understand what that means and how we can, um, can walk with him. Are you talking like what is the role of a prophet? And if there are prophets, yeah, biblical is, prophets... Today, yeah, the you see in the Old Testament, it says in Hebrews that God spoke to uh, people through the, the prophets because people didn't have a personal relationship with God, and so God loves people and He wants to communicate, and so when He He would uh, certain He would use certain people as a prophet to to speak to to the people and. Okay, now in Hebrews now it says, so in times past he spoke to his people through the prophets, but now he has spoken to us, through, he speaks to us through his son. And so now there are prophets, but their role is different. It's not to be an intermediary between God and man. It's not to be uh, the, the mouthpiece of God that we must listen to for ourselves because now we can go directly to our, our heavenly father and we can have a relationship with him, and that's what he wants. He doesn't want us to develop, a de to develop a dependency on another person to go to God for us or to tell us what God's will for our life is or what our future holds. He wants us to go directly to him, and that's what Jesus opened up for us now. So yes, there's, there, there, are Bibli there are prophets. It says, how do I know this? Because in Ephesians 4, it says God has selects, God sets some to be, some, not all. And there are prophets, there are apostles, there are pastors, there are teachers, there are, you know. And it says the purpose of every one of these people is to help build up and encourage all of the believers until we all come to the full expression of God and his nature. And so... The, the job, the role of a, of a prophet, of a true prophet now, Christian prophet, uh, would, it, it is to, to share the word of God and what he is saying, but it's for the building up of people. It's not to be somebody who we become dependent upon to tell us things about our life. You understand? So this is the deception that is out there right now. There are people who even say they are Christians, Christian leaders, who they, it seems like a big part of their, what they do, their ministry, is telling people secrets about their life and what they should do and what's come. And, and this is, There's familiar spirits that are involved with those things. Now, this is not to say that, you know, you can't get a prophetic word. This, this is still prophecy. Now, you use the word prophecy there. It's the, the New Testament definition for prophecy is, is a word from God that encourages and edifies us and can even be reading from the books that God wrote about our life as far as helping us into our purpose and our destiny. So there, there is still prophetic words that are given and a, a prophet will also be able to, um, to prophesy, but 
a prophet is not the only one who can prophesy because every believer has the Spirit of God now. And he says, and Paul says, I desire that you all prophesy. You know, so it's, it, a prophet is not the only one who can prophesy and share God's heart because if the Holy Spirit is the one who uh, also reveals things about to come and stuff, and we all are a temple of the Holy Spirit, well then we should all be able to prophesy if we are walking with the Lord, right? So as far as a prophet in the New Testament, it is somebody who will use the gift that God has given them to hear and see clearly. But he's, what he's going to do is he's just going to be sharing uh, the word. He's going to be sharing things that will build up the believers to help them to the next step in maturity and things. It's not going to put on a show. And, and I see that you have I don't know whatever you know and start oh, yeah. started kind of a show you know yeah. what I mean just, like just some, just some <laughs> huh? yeah yeah like it's it's not what yeah and so that that's the problem it's like with many things people get their eyes on the wrong things and they but but really familiar spirits what I wanted to say about this is is this be on guard just because somebody comes and tells you things and says that they are some spiritual something something and they start telling you things that are accurate that they did they couldn't know and the and their purpose in doing that is to get you to believe that they are like this man of god or whatever i don't know and and you need to believe what they say now because they're like um saying things they couldn't know but that's what witches do. That's what things familiar spirits and they have a network of their unclean spirits and they will go. Maybe they will cause uh, um, something bad to happen to somebody when they were 15 years old. And then now they're 25 and then they're somewhere else. And this person I see when you were 15, this and this happened to you. And they're like, oh, yes, that, that really did happen to me. And how do they know that? And often it will be because the, the, the familiar spirits, they know, they caused it. <laughs> or they, 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 they were there, you know what I'm saying? And so it looks like supernatural from God, but it's not from God, it's familiar spirits. And that's how they entrap people to listen to them and, and try to gain uh, influence over people. So just to be aware of that that is something that's out there, you know? Yeah, 